Dear colleagues, I would like to uh, tell you my vision, why I believe that the medicine of the, this century will be fundamentally influenced by the nanoscience. A short definition, nanomedicine, a new field in medicine as the application and applied science of the nanosciences, a science to the benefit of human health. Very related to that is the topic of uh, nano safety. But nano safety looks at the questions from a def different viewpoint. What uh, industry produces must be examined for, uh, for safety. Now, the landscape of the nanosciences is characterized by an encounter of many different fields. In our field, this means medical doctors and patients meet physicists, chemists, life scientists, engineers. This is a challenging interaction not only for the education differences and the languages we talk, but also due to the fact that in this encounter we see that the reduction to simplicity, so reductionist approach to science, and the approach of complex nonlinear systems really meet also. Human, a human being is, mathematically speaking, a complex nonlinear system, probably one of the fields in the science we have mastered the least, and we try to approach this complex system by simplistic approaches, but going to the ultimate limits. The tools of uh, nanomedicine or the tools of nanosciences, you know them well. The real eye-opener for us were the microscopes, not because we always went to the uh, last atom in the body, but it opened our eyes to the fact that if we look at life, uh, nanoscience, nano is everywhere. In uh, most of the important processes in life, nano aspects play a key role. Optics play a key role also in nanomedicine for diagnostic and analytic purposes. Materials have developed into a fundamental pillar of nanomedicine. One of the fields which is least developed but maybe become very important is the field of computational nanosciences. We need to understand what we are doing in medicine and systems are composite and complex, and we cannot do experiments for each and every material we uh, are able to design. And most fascinating for me is the question of complexity in nanosystems. How small and how complex can an object be which is man-made in comparison to a complex, very small objects from uh, our body? Our body, consisting of millions, 10 by 12 cells, uh, shows us that a cell is actually not a single unit, but it's made up of small objects at the nanoscale called organelles. The most important organelle is here, the uh, uh, ATP synthase, the molecule which creates energy for the body and which, makes, uh, which enables all life. On the other side, in medicine, we have realized that there are dangers in the nanoscale. The biggest dangers, in my view, are not the uh, man-made nano nanoparticles, but the recognition that the disease which kills half of the Western world, arteriosclerosis, is a nanodisease. LDL nanoparticles cause this disease in our bodies, as well as the viruses, uh, one of the next important killers beyond, uh, beyond cancer and also all the dirt we encounter in the environment has very important nano aspects. So to understand these diseases from the medical side, we need the nanosciences uh, because of their tools. And you will see the application of some tools after that. Let's approach now the killer number one in medicine, arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis, a nano disease. Arteriosclerosis has its well-known risk factors, age, Western lifestyle, cholesterol, diabetes, cigarettes, hypertension, and uh, a lifestyle, as you see here. It starts by incorporation of nanoparticles, LDL lipid nanoparticles, into macrophage cells of our arteries, which then accumulate and lead from a healthy artery to a very diseased artery. One of these plaques, which you see here, will break up at some point and cause myocardial infarction or stroke. And this is something we wouldn't like to develop ourselves. This is something our research 
would like to eradicate. So my long-term vision of our research is really not a kind of palliation, treating symptoms, but eradication of the most important disease which is around in the West. Historically, treatment of arteriosclerosis looks like that. You take the big knife, you make a big cut from here to here, in, and to the legs, the patients lose liters of blood, uh, get the bypass operation, but you already see for a nano disease, this macro approach is not the thing you would like. So medicine has developed miniaturization uh, technologies. Here I'm implanting a stent into a coronary artery. The stent is small, one to two to three millimeters, but still very large in the, in, uh, on the nanoscale. But in the future, it might be possible that this disease, which is caused by nanoparticles, may be eradicated by nanomaterials. Nanomaterials can be targeted toward arteriosclerotic blocks, as we have shown here in vivo, uh, and we hope that this approach may really lead to a new uh, biological, uh, new history of, of this disease. Now, life is more complicated in medicine than uh, producing new materials and applying them, because if you want to have a new therapy, we will want to help the patient. The patient only has two requests. Medic uh, drugs should help, and they should not be toxic. But society around us is much more complicated. The law says they must be well characterized. And most of you probably struggle with the question of how to characterize nanomaterials thoroughly, reproducibly, to measure them, etc. At the same time, the industry wants to have them in tons, not in grams. And a scale-up of nanomaterials is sometimes very tricky. In addition, we have the politicians who would like to have it cheap, which is also a big challenge for high-tech. And the academic would like to understand what they are doing, and this is not the least of all challenges we have. <coughs> now, one of the important subfields in nanomedicine is the targeted delivery of things, drugs, functionality, diagnostics, etc., which is very easy to visualize and very easy to understand, uh, a little bit more tricky to do in vivo because of some problems I will show you later. We are working in our experiments mostly with uh, polymeric materials uh, developed in collaboration with our physical chemists, which are hybrid molecules consisting of uh, uh, organic uh, blocks, organic ligands, and function functional groups, which form various nanostructures in the electron microscope. Now, one of the key things uh, such a nanomaterial needs to exhibit, if it was, should be useful, it should excel in two properties. First, it should excel in targeting. It should really find its target cells, its target organs, with a very high specificity. At the same time, it should excel in stealth properties. That should, it means it should be invisible to your immune system, to your blood protein, to your defense cells. And this sounds easy, but it's a big challenge because these two effects are contradictory in some approach. Imagine, for example, using a very protein-repellent shell around your nanoparticle. That means that the protein-protein interaction with the target is greatly hindered. And so finding, optimizing this interaction between nanomaterials and the body is really one of the, still one of the main challenge for success. Now, when you use such uh, objects in vivo, you can do different things. You can use these as carriers for materials which circulate a long time and slowly release their material. You can also do targeting. I believe that active targeting, as shown here, will be important because it's uh, several orders of magnitude more uh, effective than passive targeting as it's used mostly now in current trials and current studies. Active targeting means that you no need to know about your disease, about your disease cell, about the surface. You need to have suited ligands, receptors for a specific binding. And then your objects, if you do it right, may be incorporated in the cell in the matter of minutes. So the red dots, which you see, could see here if it was a little bit brighter, they go into the cell relatively quickly. Here we can learn a lot from life. So bio-inspired nanomedicine is the keyword. We can learn how bacteria invade cells. We can learn how 
viruses invade cells. We can learn how uptake and release of materials happens in the cell. And the cell has a lot of pathways which can really be exploited. One of the key messages is if you have a conventional drug, say aspirin or whatever, uh, you give it into the body, it acts everywhere, but it doesn't act particularly strong on your target cell because the target cell has a shell, has a lipid membrane which blocks the transfer of many substances. Now, if you package your aspirin or your drug into a polymeric carrier and you trick the body such that the carrier goes into the cell, what you see in many, many different experiments, you see a more than 100-fold increase in potency of this, medic, of this drug. You, the intracellular concentration of these drugs is very strongly increased. The second effect you see experimentally is that these packages, when you use active targeting, they are directed to a distinct subclass of cells, but not to others. Now, the bystander cells, which don't get the package, don't see the effect. And this means that you can abolish side effects practically in a complete manner. And this combination of a hundredfold increased efficacy while abolishing side effects almost completely, this is the golden, uh, the, 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 magic, the magic piece in medicine we were looking for several hundred years now. Imagine the, uh, the magicians in the, in the Middle Ages, they were looking for exactly this. How can you put something, uh, change something into gold, to change the characteristics of a materi material, use a tool which really helps exclusively and doesn't, doesn't hurt. Now, another aspect of such nanosystems for therapy is that they are like Lego pieces. You can compose such, a, such an object, you can recompose in a very different, in a slightly different fashion, and this recomposition may lead to very different characteristics. In our polymeric system, which just changed a single chemical group to change an arteriosclerosis system into a cancer treating system, uh, <coughs> which means that the conventional way of inventing a new drug for a given disease and developing it over 10 years and then bringing it to market at some point might change into a new way of developing generic drugs, generic systems, generic approaches, which are then adapted to given diseases, given patients, or given groups <coughs> of patients. So here our arteriosclerosis system has been modified into a T-cell lymphoma therapy and has been modified again into a leukemia therapy, these red carriers which you are seeing here. Now if you look at the mathematics of this approach, then you see that conventional drugs, they need to hit a biologic pathway. They block something somewhere in the body. And this is the effect of your drug. Now, pharmaceutical industry has developed increasingly specific drugs that are increasingly specific for a single pathway. If you look at what we are doing here, then we are adding the uh, biologic pathway targeting. We are uh, adding a tissue targeting effect by release of uh, the materials from the blood to a given tissue depending on its vascular characteristics. We are adding uh, cell targeting, active cell targeting, and we may add uh, endocytosis targeting for uh, uptake of this nanoparticle into the cell. And this means that hypothetically you could achieve a multiplication of effects, x times u times v times w, while you abolish your remote tissue uh, toxicity almost completely. The problem with this is that we have four factors now, four uh, mathematical factors, and actually we understand a lot about the first factor. So conventional pharmaceutics, bio biodistribution, kinetics, elimination, toxicity is relatively, relatively well known for conventional drugs but it's almost completely unknown for these new systems. Each of uh, your beneficial effects or your undesired effects may be mixed in some uh, complex mathematical fashion. And for the future, what we absolutely need are predictive approaches to this problem. We, need, we don't want to, the need to produce a zillion of different nanoparticles to figure out which one are toxic and which one are not. We would like to look at them and say, 
they are structured this way, they consist of these components, so they must behave according to the known, in the future, the known physiology of nanomaterials in such and such way. And that means a significant part of our work we are doing is not inventing new things, but figuring out exactly in a quantitative manner where are these materials, when are they there, how much of them is in a given tissue, what's the concentration curve over time of these materials. And this we are doing in vivo, ex vivo, in a quantitative and time-dependent fashion. Here, for example, biodistribution and elimination characteristics of a given polymeric nanomaterial. You see that uh, it shows a comp this is the, the blue is the blood concentration. It shows a long half a long persistence time in the blood, but at the same time it shows interesting two-faced uh, urine excretion patterns. It's also excreted in the bile. But if you look at tissues, you see that some of the materials are tissue persistent up to about one month. Now, this one month is not a uh, constant. This is something where you have a lot of degrees of freedom. So you can, in, uh, in fact, produce nanomaterials which dissolve in the minute after injection. You can produce nanomaterials which will persist forever. And this free freedom of design is very valuable for the engineering process of new materials. And this is different from conventional drugs where you are more or less kind of uh, given to the, to the molecular structure of the very same molecule that has to exert the biologic effect. Now it's possible to, to have very toxic materials, you know that. I'm not a friend of, uh, nano, of carbon nanotubes in the body because uh, there are too many questions at the current time. But what we know is that it's possible to design highly non-toxic materials. With this material here, for example, we are using these specific polymers for years, and up to now we haven't reached a point where we can kill a mouse with this material. It's just uh, too non-toxic. And this is something we would like. We would like to engineer non-toxicity in new materials. We also would like to use our, or what we are doing is, we are using our in vivo data, experimental data, clinical data, from our experiments, from the literature, to produce pre pre predictive models. Here we have de developed a pharmacokinetic model that includes on one side conventional pharmacokinetics, organ distribution, elimination data, and coupled it with physical chemical, chemical characteristics of our nanomaterials. Also in the end to come to a point where we really have a predictive uh, pathophysiology of nanomaterials, and also to allow us a rational design of new strategies and materials. So my view of the nanomaterials, uh, the therapeutic nanomaterials for the future, is that we should really combine what we have, materials, nanobio insights, but also the mathematics, simulation, modeling of nanoparticles, of physiology, of pharmacokinetics, uh, and to unify them into a larger image of what we are doing. Now, complex nanosystems. Complex nanosystems have been invented by science fiction uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. They shrink the doctors and the nurses and inject it into the blood. Uh, but complex nanosystems were here before. This is a T lymphocyte, a defense cell which kills a virus infected cell. And this complexity of recognition of uh, the treating disease is something we would like to see in complex systems in the future, in nanorobots. So, to build a nano device for cancer, for example, we need to sense the environment, we need to be able to switch the environment upon a pre-specified signal, the cancer is here, and uh, then the effect which follows should make sense in a medical side. That means we need to take different Legos and put them together at the nanoscale. This can be done, for example, by adding uh, channels, biological channels taken from bacteria, porine molecules, for example, to polymeric shells and allow controlled substance exchange. Here we have done added a, se a second ingredient, which is an enzyme at the inside of such a carrier. So this polymeric carrier of a size of 200 nanometer now controls the substance transfer and can uh, exert the biochemical function functionality and the inside. That means at the baseline, the system shows no color. And when it's fed through the pores with a substrate, 
it produces a green fluorescent product. On the other side here, we have used the same system where we have added glucose 6-phosphate mixed with gadolinium chloride, a highly soluble mixture. But when you give it into such a system which contains a phosphatase molecule, you cleave the phosphate from the glucose and gadolinium phosphate is highly insoluble. That means now you have a nanoscale system which produces nanocrystals of gadolinium phosphate on a very small scale. The next step in functionality which you can add is uh, switchability. If you choose a, an enzyme which is switchable, for example by pH, you can have a system which switches its an, itself on and off uh, at the given, in a given milieu. This system here, for example, switches itself off only after arrival at the target in the, in the body. So you have a, in a, a metabolically inactive system which circulates, which is looking for its target, and it's switched, off at the tar and switched on at the target. Now, this internal switch by local characteristics can be expanded by external switches. Here we have added a light switch to the system, which allows you to have a circulating complex nanosystem, finding its target in the body, and then being switched off by a light pulse here, at which point a therapeutic peptide is released from your nanoparticle and can exert an effect in the body. This is important because targeting on a molecular base is not always very specific. For example, a cancer cell may share its characteristics with some cells in the body at other locations. So we would like to be able to switch on your cancer therapy only at the given body region. And this is actually possible. We can kill off cells with such a system by using a, a light switch in certain regions. As long as we keep the light off in other regions, there is no biologic effect. Now the problems we are running into. The problems we are running into is the question of the immune system. The interaction of nanoobjects with the immune system is key. We know that since a long time because the cyclosporin neural, neural, which is the drug which allowed kidney transplantation in the past, 50, 40 years ago, is actually a nanosuspension, a nanoparticle uh, suspension. So we know that uh, nanoobjects can be strongly immunosuppressant in some cases. On the other side, we know that there can be very strongly immune stimulating, as you will hear in the next two, two talks. And mastering this uh, Janus faced uh, problem is a must if you want to develop new therapies. So, uh, a slide showing some methods we are using for understanding this interaction with the immune system, with body proteins, is uh, the, the approach of molecular multiscale modeling of polymeres, polymeric membranes, and biomolecules. Here, a result we have uh, shown experimentally is that by small changes of the design of your polymer by a single chemical group, you can convert a strongly uh, immunoreactive material into a completely inactive uh, material shell. And these details of synthesis, they need further attention. The next step in complexity is uh, replace lost functionality or treat hereditary diseases. Here we have set the goal of producing artificial organelles made from polymers. So we have looked at nature how it is. We have seen that organelles are compartments equipped with uh, substance exchanges with enzymatic pathways. And we can show that using such artificial organelles, man-made by polymers, can really be added to a cell, can stay in this cell for a long time, and can function as an expansion, can lead to an expansion of the cellular metabolic capabilities, as shown here in this green fluorescent product, which uh, arises after you feed such an expanded functionality cell with a suited uh, substrate, uh, pro, uh, substrate. Now, in the future, we would like to go away from the uh, blockbuster approach. Blockbuster approach means that everybody in the world has to eat aspirin and lipid-lowering drugs to reduce the frequency of cartilaginous sclerosis. We need to understand that the animal experiments which are done in the field are usually done on uh, white mice or black mice, which are all inbred strains, which are all the same, like, like uh, siblings, like monozygotic twins. Men are very different. 
men different, differ in their genome by about 1% individually, means, which means that we differ in a, at least 29 million base pairs each other. Now, if we make it much simpler and argue that there are only two different phenotypes per protein, we still have two by the 25,000 different humans, which is more than atoms in the universe. So, treating men and developing drugs for men is much more challenging than uh, treating mice, and there are much more so surprises. So, going beyond the blockbuster paradigm and the orphan disease paradigm, we need to develop paradigms for personalized medicine. How can we understand our patient's disease fully using advanced biomarkers, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and uh, systems pathophysiology? And how could we assign a design, assemble, test, an individually optimal and possibly unique nanodrug for a given patient and treat him. So, this question of how can we build complexity from simple, small objects will uh, give us work for a long time. There are most questions are open. How can we assess the genome quickly? This is technology that is developed currently. How can we design and produce such freely mul composable multi-component drug systems? How should we do clinical and preclinical trials? And how will the regulatory uh, uh, people react? What kind of industry and enterprises will be able to do that? Now, hopefully, our uh, impact on society will be that we live a longer time in good health, while we certainly will not achieve eternity using such uh, approaches. And just to mention it, I believe that science and medicine are not in a vacuum. We need to always to consider its uh, influences. And the ethics have always been strongly influenced by science. We have a lot of challenges in the practice of medicine, and we have a lot of shaping influence by science, because science always redefines what is man, what uh, characterizes man, actually. Let's not forget that our technology should help others which have less money, too. And I can conclude that I believe that nanoscience will fundamentally transform medicine of the future. It's new in some way, but in another way, it's, it was there since the first day of life. It's full of scientific and practical challenges, and it has implications for us. Thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your inspiring talk. Um, are there questions? I just Our pharma companies make business from blockbuster drugs. Yeah. So if we go uh, to the future medicine, which is personalized medicine, that means you need, a, in an ideal case, you need a very specific drug for each person, for each disease. So who is going to finance that and who is going to make money from it? Yes, so financing is a difficult topic, but not only a bad point. Where does the money in medicine go? Money does not only go to pharma, money, money mainly goes to salaries. So caring for chronically diseased patients is hugely expensive. And that means if the uh, visions we have of to transform dangerous diseases uh, into uh, health states where patients don't need any more treatment for many years. That means there is a lot of potential to save money. The next point is that a lot of drugs are expensive because we take them for 30 years, like antihypertensive drugs and others. That means there is a second huge potential of saving money by making medicine more effective. Instead, in, instead of taking drugs for a lifetime. So if we can eradicate uh, arteriosclerosis by nanomaterials, for example, it would eradicate my own profession, which means that the salaries of many doctors, nurses, and uh, the cost of intensive care units would go away. And such a huge saving would justify a significant investment in a therapy. So even if the therapy is more expensive, it may be cost effective uh, in, a large, in a large way. Are there more for questions? Thank you. I have a question concerning your 
using light to open your uh, Trojan horses. What is the effect behind? Do you use a thermal effect or is it uh, wavelength specific? We are mainly using two different mechanisms. One is light, uh, light cleavable uh, linkers, linking carrier molecules, polymers, and bioactive substances. And the second approach is using excited states of molecules, for example, dyes which produce uh, singlet oxygen, etc. So there are various approaches. And uh, another approach is to using uh, light breakable polymers, which lead to dissociation of your, of your vesicle. So just the topic of light, there are a large number of possibilities, of, and many of them have experimentally shown to, to work even in our group. We are preferring uh, near-infrared light because the uh, transmission depth in the body is much larger than using visible or blue light. 